Michael Maltzen arrived midway in the Los Angeles architecture revolution. So what's the role of the middleman in a revolution? Los Angeles had become a venue for experiment. And what's experiment? How about overrule the rule, or impulse over method, or instinct over system? Before experiments are entitled, there are unratified musings, speculations. If the speculations survive, on to sketches and models. Surviving that, small buildings begin to designate an alternative form language. As that tentative vocabulary is defined and built, the vocabulary itself becomes a subject that is taught and learned. And as a learned vocabulary, it becomes less impulse, more method, less instinct, more system, less overrule the rule, more ruled, and in the end, a doctrine. So according to this hypothesis, the revolution either disappears before it begins, or inevitably, over time, becomes doctrine. And in the interim, it draws adherents who come to practice the impulse, but remain to practice the method. In neither case can the revolution run interminably, or can it? You can't pick your birthday. Michael Maltzen came to join a revolution in process. The danger, no more danger, rules set, method accepted, the practitioner's task, make the awkward elegant. And here's how Michael departed from that predictable historic sequence. He didn't memorize the lesson, he amended it. In the lexicon of a relay, he reinvented the baton and has refused to hand it off. The inadvertent middleman offers us an alternative historic option. Keep it fragile, and by keeping it fragile, Maltzen sustains the revolt. So LA, the architecture revolution runs another generation. Viva la revolucion, because you can't pick your birthday. Please welcome Michael Maltzen to SciArc. Thank you, Eric, and um, thank you, Eric and Ming, for inviting me this semester uh, to be here to teach uh, and to uh, also lecture tonight. Um, I'm fascinated in contemporary cities and, and spaces uh, like Los Angeles, and especially Los Angeles. It is true that I chose to come here. Um, I was born and grew up in Levittown, New York, and I think much of about the way that I think about architecture and its relationship to culture and society is through how these places, those kinds of places, continue to question, possibly question, and define much of our contemporary world. It colors how I think about our work in respect to issues of urban life, importantly social or public space, but really what role architecture has in that equation in mediating those contexts and conflicts they productively produce. In my work, I'm continuously exploring how these issues are experienced by the user or inhabitant, the participant, primarily through the tools and the devices, things like movement and physical and visual perception. 
this is the case in many of the previous projects we've been involved in in the studio, and very much the basis with which we're going forward. And tonight, uh, I, I want to show primarily projects uh, not yet built, unbuilt, being built, uh, really the most recent uh, group of projects that are uh, uh, representing for me, um, at least for me, a kind of acceleration or direction, uh, an expansion of a set of ideas that are defining the trajectory of the work in the office. Thinking about issues of this kind of space in a place like Los Angeles in the beginning was made more complex given that such a large proportion of these types of cities, late, late North American modern cities and uh, other places, are not public in any traditional way. They're made up primarily of a carpet of single family homes with disconnected and, and, and often internalized lives. In the beginning, most of the projects I received though were the houses and I continued to approach them as distillations or microcosms of larger and more complex social organizations. Many of these projects are trying to demonstrate the intention of creating a more fluid overlapping between normally discrete programmatic spaces or roles, and it's an effort to look at ways that distinctions like public and private can coexist within the same intervention, at times reproducing, producing hierarchies and mechanisms usually associated with more urban typologies than with the house. And I want to start tonight really with, with three houses. The first is a house on Broad Beach, um, which is uh, 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 an increasingly, in a sense, a peculiar condition, but increasingly less of a peculiar condition, where we have um, on this uh, uh, site three lots that have been accumulated by, by one owner, uh, which is increasingly be becoming uh, a kind of method of operation uh, uh, along that part of, of uh, the city, Malibu, um, especially. Uh, the existing site, the existing condition, is really a continuous wall of houses. I think this is a continuous wall of houses, uh, almost a, a, a type of uh, almost a, a type of um, of row house uh, with extremely um, just pragmatic, closed, um, and consistent street walls uh, with everybody built out to their site edges and along this, uh, this, this string line. All of those, those lots tend to be 40 feet, uh, 40 feet wide. Um, into that, uh, you could say that, that, that primarily the houses were, were singular in, in um, uh, their direction. All of the houses are really about uh, really two things, and, and one of them uh, is uh, this sense of, of extraordinary privacy uh, and uh, discretion from the beach, but also they're all about the view. Um, everything here is about the view. If you walk along the beach, you begin to realize that these houses are almost like uh, a series, they look like a series of kids, but they're all, uh, their faces pressed up against the car window, all looking in, in this, this singular direction. And, and, and I think that that has a connection to what is typically very often or what, what goes for public space uh, in Los Angeles, not so much a kind of common space, but really one of a series of parallel existences with, with a group of people, the space of the highway all looking in one direction, the space of the movie, the space of the beach, all looking at one uh, particular uh, idea or element. The second thing for us was, uh, 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 that the conditions of, of that were, were peculiar because there's a large berm uh, that runs along the length of the entire beach primarily to try to, I think, save the houses from, from rogue waves, which is peculiar given how much of, of the view people are trying to get. Um, what became interesting was uh, not just that view um, and how to begin to uh, think about that, that experience. And in fact, the house is, is developed really uh, almost from that uh, singular point perspective where we've just accepted the fact of that view and the entire form of the house uh, gives itself over to that uh, in very direct ways. But secondly, this issue of, of, of what is public space, what is private space on that length of, of, of the beach. And as opposed to uh, 
uh, uh, allowing the house to come down to the ground. Instead, by beginning to float the house up over the beach, there at least was the insinuation, I think, uh, in our mind, that the house moving um, from the street, um, the beach slipping under, uh, started to create the possibility of, of a more consensual, at the very least, um, uh, relationship. The internal organization of the house uh, is very, it, it, for the most part, loft-like. Whatever walls there are on the inside of the house, once you cross that bridge, are all primarily oriented to that single uh, point perspective, um, so that the, the sense of, of the beach is almost collapsed into your view. The house is meant to be constructed primarily out of concrete as a kind of shell uh, with, a, with an interlining. Uh, the house perches up on the beach through a series of, of, of concrete structural uh, 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 stairways that allow access down to uh, the beach from and, and up into the house from, from down below, in one case uh, becoming wide enough to almost recreate a kind of uh, uh, amphitheater or, or recreation of, that, of the berm. Because of, of the amount of space that we have, uh, and because of this configuration, um, which uh, takes as a given the long street wall along the edge of, of uh, Broad Beach Road, um, being consistent with the other houses, uh, the, the house, uh, in, a, in a sense, um, operates both as a kind of row house, as I mentioned, along this edge and along the front, uh, but almost uh, becomes a more figural object on, uh, on the inside. And that oscillation between these two worlds, between fabric and, and object, uh, begin to really allow for much more development in the internal life um, of the house uh, and also in the types of, of outdoor spaces that are possible in, in, in this project. Um, the second house that is uh, just about to start in construction is in La Crescenta, and it's for uh, two painters, Larry Pittman and Roy Dowell, um, who are painters here in, in the city. Uh, Larry's on the left, Roy's on the right. Um, they have uh, and uh, bought a number of years ago uh, a uh, Richard Neutra house in La Crescenta, which sits up on the hill above uh, uh, the valley. Uh, La Crescenta is down a a along this side. Uh, this very typical kind of endless um, uh, valley of, of single-family homes. This house was built uh, in the, the 50s, the early 50s, for Neutra's assistant and her husband, uh, and was uh, built on a large piece of property. And in doing that, uh, Neutra had planned uh, for them to have the possibility of subdividing the house and built two other flat pads, one which is right below the house here, which is on the entry sequence up to, up to the house. Um, also of, of, of importance is this tall kind of iconic tree, which will, will, which will come into play in, in a minute. Um, for, for Larry and Roy, um, the thing that originally attracted them to this Neutra house was uh, very much uh, a kind of one, the, the, the importance of the house, the, the iconography of the house, but more than anything, uh, uh, really um, uh, being enveloped by this kind of romanticism for a modern ideal in Los Angeles of the way that the single family house could work, the idea that, that uh, inside and outside were completely blurred, that, that the activity on the inside of the house really belonged as much to the outside and vice versa, and any sense of, of real privacy or, or internal life, even internal psychological life to the house was, was uh, 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 impossible. And over time, that's become something uh, that for them, as observers, thinkers about uh, contemporary life, um, has become more and more problematic to really sustain. And because of that, um, be on um, because of that, they have uh, looked to develop another house that they would live in in a more permanent way, making the Neutra House guest house and, um, 
and office. And because of that, we began to look at houses that potentially um, had a much stronger uh, inversion, alter ego to the Neutra house, a kind of um, insideness as opposed to this, this extraordinary uh, and, and a, as I mentioned, very romantic exterior quality. Um, the house that we um, are developing is based on a, a, a kind of heptagon, a seven-sided figure. The um, road, as I mentioned, comes up and around and to the Neutra house, you're able to peel off into this, this new courtyard and, and continue that movement all the way inside uh, the house. The interesting thing about, um, at least interesting, it seemed like the seven-sided figure, was that when you developed a, a more even-sided figure, a s either six-sided, eight-sided, uh, it had a staticness which seemed to work against that sense of, 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 of constant, uh, constant movement. But even more so, this idea of how to um, begin to think of a form that had a relationship to the Neutra house, uh, but really inverted that, that relationship between inside and outside, led us to, um, uh, in, a, in a, a kind of accident, to these things mathematicians do, which, uh, 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 these puzzles, I, th I think they're games when they don't have much to do and they're, they're hanging out with themselves. These things called mathematical di uh, dissections, where you take, um, you're able to take a kind of singular platonic form uh, and through a series of, of different dissections, this shows a few, you can uh, uh, cut the form up and turn it inside uh, itself to create other uh, uh, even-sided or pure figures. That idea that somehow the memory of uh, one form is, is, exists in the exterior f uh, of, of the form that results from that uh, was at least a, a very interesting uh, for a starting point and began to uh, create a series of, of uh, different experiments in how that could potentially relate to not only the development of program for the inside of the house, uh, but also how it really had a consequence to the inside um, uh, uh, spatial sense of the house, trying to get away from uh, any kind of hierarchy in a, in a, in a pure geometry form that, that uh, predicated the center, um, but instead was a centerless, less hierarchical, more simultaneous interior. And the plan you see um, on the right, uh, this is a, a, a kind of court, courtyard, open space, open space. You arrive, you enter into the house through this slip, and then it's a, it, it's a kind of continuous uh, clockwise movement through the entire house, living room, dining room, kitchen, kind of office, back, back room, library, uh, bedroom and finally uh, uh, kind of bathroom suite in the back um, in, in a house that has, uh, uh, with the exception of, of kind of closet and bathroom, front doors, uh, no, other, no other doors or, or distinctions. Um, we looked at how that house um, and each of those, those rooms um, weren't, weren't developed in any kind of, as I mentioned, hierarchical way in this, this other geometric uh, sense, how they began to have these, these internal relationships. More fluid, less conventional. The entry uh, uh, view. Uh, and then the internal, um, the internal spaces uh, where that sense of simultaneity, sense of almost um, uh, 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 perspectival um, non-hierarchy, uh, uh, sense of multiplicity to the spaces begins to play out uh, in the way that you perceive the house moving, moving through it again, a non-centered experience, one in which the life, the lifestyle, um, the activity of the house happens in, in, uh, in um, from a temporal standpoint, uh, uh, again, a kind of um, uh, simultaneous or 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 uh, uh, less hierarchical, hierarchical way. There are moments from the house where that space, the perspective, begins to collapse. But there are also a number of moments. Uh, for instance, this one where, uh, in a sense, the entire house, uh, from a series of 
of expanded one-point perspectives is laid out in front of you. Looking up in the courtyard of the house. The last house I want to talk about uh, is a house which is, is in construction. Um, it's about well, maybe a quarter of the way through construction. Um, on the border of Beverly Hills and, and Los Angeles, um, it's for uh, uh, a person who um, is in the entertainment industry, uh, but is also maybe by um, uh, choice more than anything uh, an art collector. And that role uh, in, in their life, really, uh, uh, between the art collection, this, this life in the entertainment industry, makes the house uh, have to occupy this, this very peculiar world between um, being a kind of uh, mm, semi public or, or at times even public entity uh, and still trying to imagine how some level of, of domesticity or maybe intimacy could uh, possibly uh, be created. Um, the house has this problem of, of uh, uh, being a kind of mini museum um, and, and in looking at, at houses um, historically and what uh, what role they play, there is a distinction between the house and the villa. Uh, and the villa having a, a, a role which tends to be more public, um, understands that in its geometry, in the procession to the house, and the kinds of spaces uh, it occupies, uh, as well as its role um, uh, to a larger culture in general. The house is approached, um, the house sits at a top uh, uh, of a ridge really a kind of peninsula. Uh, this is south with views to the, to the Los Angeles Basin, Century City directly in front of it, a little bit of a view of the ocean in this direction. Um, and then on either side, very deep, very steep canyons. You arrive at the house um, off of, off of uh, a kind of smaller road through the canyon uh, and with a constructed new driveway, which sits like a bridge um, on a series of pilings as it uh, uh, rises up the side of the hill till you finally come to the far end of the site, the back of the site, and then turn to this moment of, of, of uh, uh, complete symmetry. And from there, the house begins to uh, slide apart, um, pull apart into uh, primarily three major rectangular forms uh, with a series of interstitial spaces that you can occupy both visually and physically. And that movement, um, really runs up, uh, then uh, uh, gets braided through the house uh, on the way out to, to the back. And this is just a small, very low resolution uh, MPEG that gives you a sense of, of the form of the house. Um, uh, each of those elements, because of the art program, has a really uh, a somewhat discrete um, uh, program. The front element is primarily gallery, entry gallery. From there, you descend into this lower um, in-between space uh, that is, is primarily all glass. And then finally arriving in the back rectangular element, which is mostly family, kitchen, family room, uh, dining room. Uh, the master bedroom floats above and is held up by two elements, um, this angled stock, which is a stair structural uh, uh, element, uh, as well as um, elevator, a glass elevator, which connects a lower level, this mid-level, and then finally the upper level. This lowest level uh, has garage, which I'll talk about in a second, uh, a, another gallery for uh, constantly changing contemporary art and uh, guest guest rooms. This is a, a, a plane of water, a reflecting pool um, above. The, the problem here of trying to deal with, because of the, the program, trying to deal with these um, uh, very simple rectangular geometries, uh, but still trying to find ways of, of animating those forms in a way that uh, began to not so much make the forms um, uh, uh, articulated in a, in, a, in a sculptural way, 
but, but try to find a way to make the forms uh, articulated in the way that you, the observer, the audience, the participant, um, the user of the house understood um, through movement so that the skin of, of, of the house would begin to um, take on uh, different characteristics, um, uh, almost a shimmering quality as you, as you moved around it. And we began to look at um, uh, metal skins uh, in a number of different patterns. We, uh, this is the one that, that basically resulted in the, in the skin that's going on the house. Um, of these patterns that you could understand from three different um, distances. One from farther away, where uh, the geometric pattern actually begins to be clear. Uh, from closer up, where you begin to see that, that the skin is perforated, has a uh, mirror finish stainless steel skin about six inches behind the perforated skin, so that as you move uh, uh, towards the house and around the house, the two skins work almost out of phase, and you get this um, quite intense moray pattern, but also where the perforations, the geometry is defined, all of the perforations are the exact same diamond um, uh, or, or trapezoid. As they get closer, forming the lines of, of the pattern, uh, the mirror seems to, because there's so, so little density, the mirror seems to come forward, and so that, that interior skin uh, uh, seems to uh, really emerge and become the exterior skin. These are just a series of um, uh, images from the, the different mock-ups that have been produced over the course of the project. The top one shows you the outer skin and the mirror finish on the inside, and there's a moment when you get quite close that uh, the lightness of the house, the fact that the house feels assembled as opposed to uh, really enclosed as a singular form becomes much clearer. This was an early mock-up uh, at Zaner Metals in Kansas City where we were testing some of this. Uh, this is a, a slightly later mock-up. The top box, the master bedroom box, um, in a sense the most private of all of the spaces, is a place where the mirror finish comes out and becomes the actual exterior skin. So as you look up to that form, um, it's primarily reflecting the sky, the context, um, uh, 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 the clouds around it. This is just, this is another small, you, you begin to get a little bit of a sense of the moray pattern on the right hand side, um, sliding around the other house. Also certain transparencies through the skin um, and the fact that the house is really developed uh, as a series of of artificial planes and cantilevers. So as you move through the house, you're not just moving through it um, from north to south, but you're also moving vertically. Um, in that middle section, as I mentioned, uh, you come down, there are offices um, uh, on below that main gallery. Uh, these are the two kind of twisted columns holding up that entry gallery, which has a, uh, is completely open on the front. There's a large Solowit, new Solowit installation. Um, pencil drawing on the inside. Um, uh, office, which is library, which is a series of cascading steps so the, the uh, uh, room gets quite tall. Uh, living room, um, reflecting pool on the outside, um, small uh, kind of den, uh, dining room, which is completely open to the outside. These long planes, which are a series of transparent and slightly um, reflective glass uh, uh, interplane uh, so that the, the reflections really double back on themselves constantly, kitchen and, and uh, family room section of the house. And again, another image of uh, where you really begin to get this sense of um, uh, moments where, where you understand that, that uh, the ground itself is completely constructed, uh, but that contrary to the Pittman Dowell House, where that simultaneity really um, uh, is manifest primarily in plan, uh, that there is a sense of, of incredible connection, simultaneity um, vertically in section in this house. It's the lower level uh, garage. Um, uh, up to the library, gallery, screening room, and um, uh, guest rooms, which are under the reflecting, re reflecting pool. And a view down um, from the tab, the, f the lawn, which uh, it, it becomes this landscape, quite intense landscape element. We're working with Tom Leader, um, landscape uh, architect, uh, 
uh, and this becomes a kind of, um, it doesn't look like it at all here, but almost a kind of uh, peculiar terrarium. Um, and then down into the uh, library below. This is just a, a view of construction as of about two weeks ago. Um, we, we've um, increasingly begun to work outside of Los Angeles. We have for, for a few years. And for me, I've become aware that the use of, of the term context and what it's meant in architecture doesn't really fit anymore in describing what we're really focused on. But rather, it's an interest in understanding the existence of, 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 of characteristics, uh, perhaps more abstract, ambient, at times uh, more ephemeral, that we're trying to relate to, extend, challenge, and that are both informing and forming the building, the architecture, space, and experience. Arriving at this point has been important for me as we try to imagine more propelling aspects of a given project situation that, that while resisting um, a kind of easy categorization are no less tangible. And perhaps paradoxically, I'm looking to the design to develop its qualities and its instincts through such a deep commitment to the inherent characteristics of the existing site or situation uh, that the new is ultimately somehow liberated from it. Not really a transformation, but really a kind of transposition. And, uh, uh, the project that uh, I want to show next is a project that we've been working on for about two years in Jinhua, China, which is south of Shanghai, um, about three and a half, four hours uh, south of Shanghai. Um, it's an uh, uh, incredibly, well, this is not an unusual story for, for China, but it's an incredibly fast-growing city. Um, it is considered right now a small city. It's about five million people uh, in the surrounding area. Uh, but it's been designated by the central government as a fast growth city. And it's meant to be about 10 million people in, um, uh, in about, uh, I guess it's about seven to eight more years. We've been working in this uh, project, uh, for a very small project, with uh, an artist and, and an architect uh, who Robert and Marianne mentioned in their studio um, uh, as well, Ai Weiwei, who's one of really the preeminent sculptors and, and I would say incredible empresarios at some level in uh, China. His father is from Jinhua, and his father was one of the most famous poets in China uh, uh, pre-Cultural Revolution. And um, uh, during the Cultural Revolution, uh, uh, Ai Weiwei's father, family, as well as Ai Weiwei, uh, were sent to the steppes of Mongolia, banished to the steppes of Mongolia, where his father cleaned toilets as, as a job, and Ai Weiwei would accompany him. Over time, they were more or less rehabilitated by the government. They were allowed to come back to the suburbs of Beijing. Um, and for a time, uh, Weiwei moved to New York, came back, and in coming back, uh, has developed a very interesting relationship with a number of projects, including quite a few projects uh, with uh, two major projects with Herzog and Demeron, one of them being the, um, the uh, Olympic Stadium. Here in Jinhua, the city f uh, planners, trying to get ahead of that incredible growth, asked Weiwei to come and develop a, a, a park. Uh, and his idea uh, was to develop on this river uh, uh, just on the outskirts of, of the development. And, and I can tell you right now, to take this image um, uh, two years later, on the right-hand side, there's just rows and rows of enormous housing blocks. But that long linear stri uh, strip of a couple of miles uh, of, of the, um, the city is where this park is located. And into this, uh, Ai Weiwei has uh, planned a park, designed a park, and then asked 16 architects, um, uh, uh, 10 architects um, from outside of China, six architects from, from China, to all do small cultural pavilions, as opposed to trying to accumulate all of the uh, normal uh, visitor center, cultural galleries, bookstore, all into one building, uh, which would be the inevitable program at one end of this, this uh, park. He's instead pulled it apart, atomized it, and, and looked at creating a kind of constellation of, of these pieces that different, different architects have done. And so Herzog and Demeron are doing one, Toshiko Mori, Fernando Romero, Tatiana Bilbao, uh, 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 quite a few younger uh, architects. We have a bookstore about 2,000 square feet, teeny project. Um, and 
uh, for me, interesting partially because uh, I, I think the history of the book certainly has been a very complex one, not only in the recent history of China, but also in the, in the longer history of China. In looking and researching a number of gardens in uh, this part of China, we came across one uh, that has this very beautiful iconic wall, which is a kind of wall which you see very often in, in gardens in China. Um, one that is both uh, a definer of space and an icon on its own, so it has this, this dual function. This one has a kind of myth around it, which is in a previous uh, political purge, uh, the intellectuals uh, took up all of the books that were in danger of being destroyed and hid them in this wall. Um, and after all of the intellectuals, for the most part, were either banished or killed, years and years went by. And when uh, the new government, in looking to create a more, um, uh, more of a visitor destination, started to renovate this, this, uh, uh, this garden, uh, they were replacing the plaster. And by doing that, all of the books that had been there from a previous generation poured out, kind of exploded out of the wall. And that idea uh, of, of this wall that, that had, had for a long time contained these, 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 these beautiful things, um, almost being pulled apart in two directions, began to really develop the form of the building um, to the point where uh, this, this faceted uh, double perspectival form developing from a uh, central wall uh, 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 began to really develop. It also had, by, by bending the form, had the, um, the value of, as you move around uh, the site, the pavilion taking on very, very different characteristics. So at times it feels very long, at other times it feels uh, in, impossibly narrow. Uh, and that site, being next to the bridge and the levee of the water, is able to be seen from a number of levels. Uh, and that also plays into um, uh, the building as it, uh, it's being developed. This is a, a kind of construction image. This is, it's just finishing. Um, we've had all of the the kind of typical issues of, of how it is finishing, um, how it is being finished. Uh, but you get a sense here of how the, the landscape is really growing in with these series of pathways that intersect. The bookstore is developed on two, with two different programs, the wall in the middle. On one side is the bookstore itself with a small cafe on a mezzanine. On the other side, and what you see here is an open reading room with these perforations allowing uh, air, light uh, to come into that space. That reading room acts as a mm, kind of impromptu space um, for not only reading of books, uh, but readings, uh, public, uh, public discussions. Uh, so that is very much a part of the consequence of, of the bookstore. On the interior of the form, um, I was interested in how spatially that could take on uh, a very different characteristic, maybe one that had a different level of equivalence to some of, of uh, the, uh, the garden architecture in and around uh, Jinhua. And I became very interested in these kinds of um, moon gates or apertures, not, not for the aperture quality of it, not, not for the sense of a kind of deep space or, or a focusing, but really much more for the possibility of a different type of exaggerated profile that became not so much a line, but also potentially became a kind of space. And so inside this form, um, I began to, uh, to look at drawing a series of, of interconnected um, uh, loops, profiles, that as you move through the building, from the outside to the inside, uh, constantly emerged in their re uh, relationships from certain points where perspectively, uh, one form on the floor that you enter up through almost becomes uh, the cutout uh, at one registration point on the wall, uh, but also a kind of looping emerging line um, through, the, through the building. And here you see what the walls pulled off, at least the intent of, of, of that, the bookstore closer the uh, reading room up above, uh, a view up through that hole. Uh, we looked a lot at the perforations and the way that um, that would bring very different characteristics over the course of the day, so that the building almost uh, becomes a kind of sundial at some level. Um, it's still waiting to be uh, painted on the inside. 
Um, I uh, was fascinated in doing this project, and it's a kind of side note, in that um, for the longest time I've wanted to build a building out of concrete. And being primarily in Los Angeles, it seems like all you get to build out of is steel and, 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 um, and wood. Um, stick building things. And the idea of building out of concrete was, was uh, something I was really fascinated with and I thought fantastic. We're building in China. Everybody builds in concrete in China. We're going to build a concrete building. But because of, and we designed a building out of concrete, um, because of uh, the, um, the weight of the building out of concrete on this riverbed, this kind of floodplain, the depth of the caissons, the um, impossibility of the foundations, the instability of the double cantilever, uh, required, it, it meant that the Chinese came back to us and said, we need you to build it out of steel. And that became a real problem because those perforations, the idea of that skin had really been predicated on this, this much um, uh, more, uh, well, uh, construction technique that would allow for that. Guy Nordenson, who's a structural engineer who we've worked with for uh, on a number of projects, developed this incredibly, I, I think, beautiful, extremely elegant system of these, these kind of Virendil ladder trusses and a series of braces that really ran through those different perforations. And here we're building uh, a model to really begin to look at what that looked like, the perforations on the skin um, that don't show in some of the photographs, they haven't pulled off all the layers, allow for that, that structure to really show through so that there's this double reading as you get closer, you see this internal cage. Uh, and just the last, last view of that. Um, I want to talk uh, quickly about two projects and then finish with two last projects. Um, uh, the first one is a project that um, was an invited competition uh, that we didn't win for a project called the Canadian Museum of Human Rights uh, in, in Winnipeg um, uh, on uh, important crossroads um, at River uh, Highway connector between the two uh, parts of the city and a kind of floodplain uh, in this park. Um, tr major train station on this axial relationship pedestrian bridge. Uh, it's been a kind of crossroads for uh, that part, the middle of Canada for many years, including a lot of the indigenous people who, who came to this, this site. Um, the project, we, as I mentioned, we didn't win the project, but it was influential for me because it created a kind of shift or opening in the direction of the way in which space and experience in our projects was, was being pursued and, and really structured up until that time. In many of the projects previous to this, this competition, I'd say that the, the, the building users, the, the, the engagement between uh, the, the, the user and the building was manifest more as a series of, of really predetermined pathways, kind of itineraries, a narrative. And it became increasingly critical of this for, for a series of, uh, of reasons. And I started to see the possibility in a more open, conversant network of movement where the building user, the viewer, as well as the, the passive or, or incidental urban inhabitant in both active and as well as ambient roles is connected to a, to a continually emerging and elastic set of relationships with form, program, site, and, and each other. And here you see um, a kind of model of the building as it lifts up off uh, this floodplain. Um, the building is organized as a series of, of exhibition lobes around with this very irregular form that, that has certain relationships to the surrounding context. Uh, but at the center, uh, there is this very pure geometry, this, this, this square geometry, with a series of, of these intersecting bridges and, and, and raised platforms that, that run across um, so that the ambulatory, the kind of traditional ambu ambulatory of, of, the muse of, of the space or of the courtyard is no longer around the uh, side, but really directly uh, through it. This came from an idea in the program brief that um, uh, the museum, because of the intensity of the, of the contents, they show um, uh, quite, in many cases, graphic uh, pictures, videos, films of, of Canadians, at, uh, like many countries, not, not particularly um, a fantastic record of, of human rights, especially as it relates to um, a lot of the indigenous people uh, there. Um, 
they had developed in the program this idea of these, what they call decompression chambers. They were these small rooms that you would, after seeing the contents, uh, learning about certain events in each of these, these different lobes, you would, you would go into the decompression chamber and somehow uh, uh, allow that experience to, um, to deal with that experience. And it just seemed horrific that you would then go into these little rooms with a bunch of people all looking at each other. Um, it, it seemed like a kind of almost inhumane way of having to, to make that experience personal in some way. So this change, this idea that movement, the ambulatory, uh, which in courtyards historically was always the, the space in which lessons intellectually somehow got manifest through the, the physicality of movement, um, that, that it became much more um, intertwined with you in your complete, uh, your complete being. And, and so um, these, these pathways were intended to really begin to be the same thing. Um, they also, they had a, uh, a structural component, the building with these long cantilevers uh, were tied together as a kind of ten structural tension net or, or cat's cradle uh, that allowed for those, those, those pedals to um, uh, really lift up. Here you can see a plan. Um, that project led quite consequentially into a project that we were involved in um, with uh, uh, the team uh, for the Parco Garibaldi in Milan, uh, just outside of uh, the second ring in Milan. And uh, this is a project in which uh, we were collaborating um, as, as a, a, a team uh, of equal partners with um, Petra Blaise, a landscape uh, designer from the Netherlands, uh, and Mirko Zardini, uh, who's now at this um, Canadian Center for Architecture, but is also a theorist and, and urbanist and is, is from Milan, um, and, and as well as a, a couple of other people who played um, uh, slightly smaller roles, like uh, Irma Boom, the, the graphic designer from the, the Netherlands as well. Um, the park, uh, Garibaldi Park, is a project uh, between the Garibaldi and the central train stations. Um, and here you see the central station. This uh, picture is taken from uh, uh, just over by the Pirelli Tower in the central station, Milan, the kind of center of Milan, the first ring, is right here. Uh, this is an area that in the Second World War was heavily bombed because it was in the middle of these two train stations and has never been developed because of a series of, 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 of kind of social and, and, and political uh, intertwinings um, that we've increasingly, as we've tried to get further along with this project, found out about intimately. Um, uh, we looked at, at trying to develop this park um, uh, really as, as, as a new, more interwoven series of communal and individual experiences that I began to talk about, referred to in the Canadian mu Museum, um, but was here able uh, to be able to expand the scale of an individual building transposed to, to the scale of an urban intervention, an urban park, intersposed with a large and, and rapidly developing precinct of the city. And in our plan, we became interested as a group very quickly, not so much in the, in, in the, the park itself, but even more so in the urban edges of the park and the site and surrounding new and emerging neighborhood boundaries. And our park proposed uh, an edge that went outside of the competition brief, which was this rectangle. Uh, Pierre Luigi Nicolin, who had developed the master plan, had, had set up a very rigorous rectangle uh, and um, challenged the purity of, of that, that space uh, that they had prescribed and instead began to seep into adjacent areas where we could identify areas that were some um, softly defined politically um, uh, and, and from a control standpoint. It was this inclination that led us to try and invent a way of making more progressive connections across the park between, into, and in some cases through those edges. And this was, this was really accomplished in, in two ways. One was a series of oblique and interconnected pathways cutting through the park in a, in a very insistent manner. Uh, these, these pathways collect activity, landscape, and views along the way, uh, as well as uh, lay out um, the uh, information for the spaces in between, which were uh, uh, developed as a botanical garden, a kind of library of trees in Milan. 
The second, um, here you see a, an image of that. The second was um, to develop a campus of buildings uh, loosely organized, oriented um, in kind of visual and, and geometric ways uh, that produced um, a new kind of uh, uh, social, uh, programmatic context on the site. That campus of buildings, all of which were in a sense inventions, uh, fashion museum, uh, fashion school, uh, community center, um, which had a gym, uh, bookstore, and meeting rooms, uh, artist studios, which are attached uh, to this uh, older kind of long courtyard building, which uh, has a series of uh, arts, kind of artist squatters who have taken over the building um, uh, and, and did so in the 60s. And this becomes, these artist studios is also a daycare center that's a part of that. Uh, and then an exhibition tent for multiple, uh, multiple purposes. Um, these are some of, some of the, the buildings, uh, again, very conceptually uh, developed, but in some cases locking quite specifically into uh, this geometry of, of those pathways. In this case, you can see the um, cafe and bookstore, the meeting rooms for the community, the health club with the pool, uh, community health club with the pool on top. The octopus uh, building is um, the fashion school and is directly over one of the main arterial streets um, in this area of Milan, uh, opaque on the exterior with this glass interior that you see as you drive through and under uh, so that you begin to see the activity from underneath. Um, and because of the traffic between the trains, uh, as well as a metro station, there are a series of bridges and tunnels uh, that bridge across the street through the program that allow the public uh, to literally circumnavigate not only the street, uh, but the building and the park itself. Um, the exhibition tent, which is a kind of bug. I want to finish with two projects that uh, are really a attempting to negotiate the ideas uh, that I've been talking about uh, in a more comprehensive way. And, and because of their scale and, and uh, singular buildings, uh, I think are really afforded the possibility of, of working um, both at the scale of individual buildings, but also very much uh, at an urban or more public scale. In both cases, the buildings uh, oscillate between their own identifiable singularity and also participate in this larger, in a kind of larger context whose goal is, is to renegotiate the way each of the types of buildings normally participate in those contexts. And the first of these is a project we've been working on for a while um, in, uh, in Fresno, uh, in California. Fresno is the fastest growing city in California. Um, it, uh, is uh, at the center of the Central Valley, which has been an agricultural center and is rapidly changing um, as other types of service enterprise, uh, the IRS, the federal government, number of healthcare hospitals uh, come into that, that district. Uh, the grid of the city, uh, which is also the grid of the ag uh, agricultural land, literally comes through. Our site is here. Um, the major part of the city has been uh, this, this this part of development, there's a, uh, something called the Fulton Street Mall along this edge. This was actually a Victor Gruen project, one of the first outdoor pedestrian malls, um, which has been, uh, well, moderately, well, it's moderately a failure um, along that edge. Um, but uh, there is increasing development at a, uh, from a cultural level. Predict Frain won a history museum competition a few years back, which is meant to go here. New Central Library is about to be built on this site. Fresno State has a downtown campus, which is, is growing here. Uh, 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 Latino Museum is expanding, and the public television station is on this side. And the city has really designated this as, as uh, uh, meant to be the, the center of, of a kind of public or cultural life. Um, there are a number of issues. Uh, on this site in imagining this is a kind of larger public space. Um, and it is one of the goals to make this space truly uh, a, large public, a large public space. The first is uh, that the site is incredibly porous, very low density. Um, and so the traditional sense of, of making a, a kind of urban room um, is, is impossibility because, because there's, there is no containment, there's no definition to that street, to that, to that site. Instead, we began to look at whether it was possible to pressurize uh, that space almost vertically, to take that, uh, those walls and begin to think of it 
uh, uh, taking place vertically. The second thing is that if you imagine a kind of public space as being a benefit there, um, the climate of Fresno is uh, for a large part of the year blastingly hot. It's not unusual to have many days, 100, 110 degrees. Uh, and so the idea of doing that uncovered uh, is almost an impossibility. Um, the building uh, sits on the site. There's an existing uh, small building uh, that is a part of, of the overall project, which is being developed into administration offices and a kind of education center at the top and a public room down below. Um, our building uh, floats in the center of that site and literally floats off of, off of the ground. One, creating a kind of parasol for that, that public space, um, uh, creating the compression I talked about, but also uh, uh, allowing the entire museum, the content of the museum, to be on one floor plate, but in such a horizontal landscape to still allow the building to have a kind of iconic presence in the city, which is, is one of the goals. The facades building, uh, uh, as you move around it, seems to be sliced, um, uh, e expanded, pulled apart with those seams uh, creating multi-directional views of, of uh, both uh, through the site as well as into the building um, from the side facades and the underneath of, of the building. Um, that life along the plaza uh, interacts quite substantially uh, because of a series of, of, of those sectional cuts with the life in the museum itself, uh, allows the, the form to take on very different uh, uh, impressions, form, um, figuration uh, uh, across the course of the day. We worked on this project um, quite uh, intimately with, with Guy Nordenson uh, again, uh, uh, and in thinking about this project, that relationship in, in, uh, between structure and form and architecture is increasingly becoming something which is driving uh, the, the development of the architecture in, in my work. Uh, here, to produce those, those long cantilevers to really make the building float, uh, 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 Guy, along with ourselves, developed a system in which the, f the floor plate of the museum is a series of quite orthogonal trusses um, with an outside perimeter. And at each of the, the, the support points, there are three major support points, uh, the trusses that allow, f the cantilevers can be developed in one of two ways efficiently, well, uh, somewhat efficiently. You can increase the amount of steel in singular beams reaching out for that cantilever. Um, or you can use trusses and adjust the geometry of the trusses. And in this diagram, you see a, it's basically a force diagram, uh, the larger orange forces being where this, the really significant cantilever forces are developing. What that does by, by allowing the trusses and the truss geometry um, to, to really follow very directly the force diagram is to create this faceted uh, underbelly in which and at some level, the architecture is almost literally connected, uh, creating this, this, this much more intensely animated form, um, uh, which is, I think, arguably the main facade of, of the building. Here you see some of the slices, um, views into the lower level of the parking garage and arrival. Uh, the pools of water, there are three major pools of water are about four inches deep. They follow the form of the building. They do a series of things. One, they're part of the overall sustainability and environmental control of, of the building. They create a kind of microclimate in that space. They certainly add a level of, of, of animation to the underneath of, of, of this form as the sun hits and reflects back onto the form. Uh, but it also allows us to scale the plaza. Because these, these um, pools are only about four inches deep, uh, when events get larger and larger, uh, there are cister cisterns below the plaza that we can drain the water quite quickly into and allows the plaza to get larger and larger um, or smaller and smaller as you fill those, those pools back up. I'm not going to go too much into the, the space, but this is an art and science museum. The overlap programmatically um, played quite heavily into not only the form of the building but the plan of the building. Um, with these, these blue spaces um, uh, 
these art and science, what they call response spaces. They're, they're basically galleries that get programmed by an artist and a scientist uh, together. The truss is the open floor plate. And then a view of the roof, um, which certainly has a, um, a pragmatic function of controlling the sun, allowing these different uh, clear stories to all operate individually, uh, but uh, also creating a place uh, the roof is occupiable. You can get up in that horizontal landscape and see out. Um, but I think um, uh, has a, a, a kind of analogous um, appearance to that far horizon, uh, which because of, of the agriculture, because of the water, tends to very often have an almost mirage-like quality, a kind of shimmering quality, uh, where the form of the building uh, as this middle ground between you as the viewer and that far horizon begin to collapse. The la last project I want to talk about uh, is an invited, was an invited competition which we recently won also in Milan um, uh, for a new building for Pirelli. Um, this is a, a project uh, uh, in an area called the Bacocca. Um, and the Bacocca is an area uh, just outside of, of really the city proper in a, in a kind of quasi um, uh, middle ground, not quite suburban, um, but really maybe post-industrial. This is all the area that Pirelli used to have uh, all of their tire factories. And over time, they've, they've outsourced or shipped uh, those factories overseas. And it's produced this enormous amount of land holding. And since the 90s, they've been developing these sites, um, uh, uh, mostly housing, not particularly auspicious housing, uh, but increasingly with this kind of big box, almost uh, North American suburbanism. This is a multiplex cinema, and behind here is, is kind of their version of Target. Um, the site that we were given for a new office building was on this portion of this major uh, major road. There are a couple of office towers, this kind of peculiar remnant of um, the factories, which is a, a water tower. Um, but there was also in their program the possibility of a small building and a small building. Instead, we looked more deeply into their program, which said a couple of things. One, that um, they wanted the flexibility of being able to take this uh, singular building and lease it uh, to multiple tenants, themselves uh, holding a major portion of it, but also the possibility of another tenant, but also the possibility that they would take the entire, entire building. Um, secondly, there was uh, this sense of uh, the building, very clear program, that the building had to meet very specific environmental and sustainability criteria. Um, we took the building as opposed to one larger piece on this site and split it into two towers, one slightly smaller than the other, on this site and this site with a bridge at the mid-level connecting them. That did a couple of things um, uh, for us. One was to make a building that somehow uh, began to, um, uh, again, uh, occupy this, this middle uh, uh, ground, this kind of oscillation between it being a part of, of these, these bigger boxes, uh, in, in a sense being quite aggressive about trying to almost attach visually to this, um, uh, this multiplex, but also beginning to drag that out to a more typical urban condition of, of the street corner, um, but then the other major corner being more open and being a kind of plaza. It allowed us to, uh, in this increasing densification, uh, leave open uh, these these larger um, spaces, although there's parking and some um, kind of low density retail and a little bit there. Uh, for anybody coming by car to the buildings, they park here and here and enter up through the building. Um, uh, the bridge and the two buildings uh, do produce a kind of gateway into this or threshold into the development itself. Um, uh, as I mentioned, those two buildings are really connected by this bridge. Um, uh, that forms uh, a gateway or passageway, a kind of threshold uh, into, the, into the site. Um, there are moments in this, this uh, fairly repetitive facade where the bridge hits uh, that the form begins to uh, delaminate or, or pull apart, um, those allowing uh, much larger views into the program uh, 
public space um, of these, these open plazas really pouring into uh, the buildings. The bridge, though, uh, being internal um, uh, common spaces, which I'll talk about in a second, the section of the building, you can begin to see one of the buildings in the way that you move, move through. Um, Fresno in terms of the relationship between structure and, and architecture that, that he and, and ourselves had produced, to look at the way in which the um, structure, the uh, uh, mechanical systems, the environmental uh, qualities of the interior spaces all had a kind of equality. Um, the first part of that was structurally thinking about uh, both of these buildings uh, in a way that was not just a series, was not a column grid and 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 and, and uh, uh, floor plates, but instead was this um, uh, X truss that, or kind of bat wing truss that runs through the building in two directions. Um, these frames are almost space frames. They have they have dimension to them, so they have a kind of uh, uh, open core uh, in them. It makes for an incredibly efficient structure, uh, incredibly efficient steel structure. Uh, this whole portion under the brace frame is, is able to be hung in tension. There's small areas on these levels which do have to be propped in a more conventional gravity uh, uh, way. Um, uh, there are larger beams and because of the lightness of the floor on this level that allows for this, these floors to be hung as well as these outrigging floors to be hung as well. But even more importantly, the entire middle floor with the exception of the core and the crossing of this truss, uh, the, crossing of the, um, uh, the structure is completely open with, with no columns. Um, and that's really where the bridge connects um, with these different programmatic elements uh, uh, through the center of the building. Those structural atria, those bat wings, because they're open, are glazed and it allows through a, a venturi effect, a kind of chimney effect, to bring cool air constantly inventing through the building which allows uh, uh, cool air to be drawn from the outside perimeter of this, of, of this double facade. Uh, so even in, in fairly deep floor plates, there's, there's a constant um, uh, movement of natural air. These are really early diagrams of, of, of what those uh, atria are like. Um, it does, though, allow for the occupants of the building to see occupants on other floors starting to uh, uh, break down the, com the common um, uh, hierarchy or, or separation that you see in most office floors. The bridge, as I mentioned, had, has um, uh, its own particular function. We looked at grouping the majority of the conference rooms, daycare center, and cafe all on this, uh, on this floor so that it creates uh, a kind of collector both um, from the bottom, the, the lower floors, and the upper floors down trying to, to really hypercharge a more uh, semi-public space within these buildings. And then finally, the skin itself. Um, uh, as I mentioned, the, the sustainability program was, a, was, was, a, uh, was extremely important. That also really began to play out in the articulation, the iconography of the exterior of the building, where this um, uh, series of facets prefabricated panels, actually lightweight concrete panels, uh, uh, create um, uh, both sunshades in certain directions as you move around the building, uh, creating opaque facades uh, that then change to, um, to, to very transparent facades. Uh, but through their geometry, create a series of light shelves that bounce light up into the soffits and deeply into the building for natural, natural light. One of our concerns was, um, especially where the bridge hit, uh, developing a, a level of repetition that would be affordable. And these are diagrams that, that, that begin to show that, that really the majority, about little, almost 85% of the building is completely repetitive uh, with unique panels being around 9% nine, nine um, uh, of the uh, entire building. And, and, and here you really see uh, uh, that texture, the, the, the kind of sense of, of well, maybe a, a kind of sense of, of that life behind. Um, but the, the result, maybe the consequence of, of uh, this collaboration between uh, these different um, uh, engineers, consultants, uh, as a much more integrated team, which uh, I think as we go forward as an office uh, has very much to do with uh, the place that we're finding both invention 
um, uh, process, uh, uh, but also the language for the, the architecture going forward. I want to thank um, uh, Eric again, and, and Ming also, who um, had uh, uh, a couple of years ago asked me to be here. Um, I really appreciate it. I'm looking forward to the semester. Thank you. Thank you.